that's going to land at the south pole of the moon, probably on the rim of a crater called Shackleton. And it's no coincidence that the crater that uh, is at the south pole of the moon is called Shackleton. Um, and also, we know there's ice there. We've known this for over 20 years, that in the lunar dust, there are shards of ice. And that's what this volatile rover is going to examine, because that ice is very important for future bases. It feels like we're doing a chemistry show tonight, actually, David. We were just talking to a food processing expert, talking, talking to us about how fertiliser production yields a byproduct in the form of carbon dioxide. Uh, but the chemistry on the moon, you, there are no second chances. You've got to make it work. And if your people are up there on a moon base uh, and they need the staples to support life, and, and ice, ice in the, or, you know, water, clearly a key part of that. Well, that's right. I mean, the moon base is... Uh... It's going to be something that's going to be developed over this, this decade. By the end of the decade, there will be people living on the moon in six-month rotations. And the ice is a vital component of, of their life. Now, if um, things went wrong, they could get back in a couple of days. So there will that always will be built into the moon base uh, scenario. But the ice from the poles of the moon um, will provide drinking water, will provide irrigation, uh, but will also, when they're turned into liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, will provide rocket fuel. And this is going to be, you know, a major part of the life of a, their Shackleton crater um, coming up there, a major part of the life of a moon base. And also, the fact that this is at the South Pole is important because um, the South Pole is these, it's a land of deep shadows. In fact, there are some craters at the South Pole, Shackleton included, where the sun never shines. It's colder in those craters than on the surface of P Pluto, the most distant um, planet. And that's why the ice has accumulated there. It's never been burnt off by the sun. And this is a land where the sun is a, it's, it's a wonderful land of shadows. If you were standing at the south pole of the moon, where this viper is going to land, where the base is going to be built, where the first footprints going back are going to be set, um, you would see the Earth in one position in the sky. And over a month, it would go through a series of phases, crescent, mm. full, uh, etc. Right. But the sun, the sun would walk all the way around the horizon. So the shadows, very deep, very long, would move around like the hands of a clock. Ah. It's a wonderful, evocative, significant part of the moon, which we're all going to get to know when we land there. Apollo 11 landed at the equator, the Sea of Tranquility. This is a very different part of the moon. Uh, and you depict it beautifully. I mean, David, just in terms of how we get the moon base built, I mean, compared to the late 60s, uh, communications technology, uh, the computerised technology that's available to us now, the computing power, uh, and the robotics, presumably just means that, uh, you know, humans only need to get involved at a, at a much later stage. You can send up a lot of this stuff uh, robotically, it can be sent, uh, you know, effectively by drone spaceships, not, not, not crewed spaceships. You're quite right. When the first crew of two land on the moon in a few years' time, Viper will already be there and some other pre-positioned platforms, and they will guide the, guide the landing in. They will know much more precisely how to land. Not like Neil Armstrong having to go to, to manual and look for a place to land not sure he could find it. We will know the landing site intimately. We already do. We've got incredibly detailed photographs of, the, of this region where we're going to build the moon base. So it's a, it's, it's, it's the, this crater, Shackleton, is the most studied crater on the moon. We know it intimately. We know where we're going to land. We know where the rover's going to land. We even know the route the rover's going to take to look at the shadows and the small craters, to dig up bits of soil, to look for this ice, because... We know there's ice there. We've seen it from orbit, but that we have to have the ground truth now. So we need to know what form the ice is in. And once that's confirmed, then the base will go there. We will take, in the past, it used to be thought you'd take up huge aluminium cylinders and dump them on the surface, and that would be your main base. No, the way to do it these days is to take a 3D printer and actually oh. mess up the lunar dust, turn it into a sort of toothpaste, and then print out igloos from lunar dust. This is going to be the most remarkable moon base. This time yesterday, we were hours away from the launch of the first all-private mission into orbit. It went according to plan. 
and the crew of four are now flying higher than any astronaut since the days of the Space Shuttle. Well, the expert and author Andrew Lound is joining us now to consider what they'll be getting up to. Three days in, in orbit, I think, Andrew. Um, let's uh -huh. start with this, this wonderful cupola, 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 <laughs> the, <Cupola>. the dome, <laughs> <laughs> which, they, the, which is three-ply, you know, bit of glass, space, scary stuff, but basically the best view of the planet in orbit right now, and they're enjoying it. Yes, it's probably the best view any individual has ever had, really. I mean, for for people who who know the the SpaceX, the the Dragon spacecraft has a has a nose cone which actually opens like a little door, uh, and that's normally the docking mechanism. But the docking mechanism's gone because it doesn't need to dock with anything. So they put this dome <laughs> uh, on there, so you can actually sit in the dome with it around over your head and have a look round and and see the. Earth. I mean, you get a three sixty degree view of the Earth. Absolutely a staggering uh, view of the Earth, really, that you would get with it. It must. Be interesting to see, uh, hear the comments that they make when they actually, uh, when 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 they've seen the Earth through that, because that must be an amazing sight. It reminds you very much of some science fiction films where they, you've always had this. You've had it on Red Dwarf, you've had it on Dark Star, where they've actually sat with this dome over their head. So it would be quite wonderful, and each of them will obviously get plenty of time to sit there looking at the wonders of the Earth and, and obviously looking elsewhere as well, because as I keep emphasising to some people, it, from my personal perspective, I'd be wanting to look out there as well at the stars and looking at the moon and looking beyond, because this is just the starting point. Too lavatorial about this, Andrew, but uh, the, the way I've read it, and I'm sure you have too, is that obviously there's not that much room in the capsule and the cupola that we're talking about, the, the dome through which they were looking, is actually screened off. So when you, you're up there uh, taking a view, you might be doing something else because it's where the toilet is. Uh, <laughs> do I exaggerate? No, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, when I've gone round to schools and when I've gone round to e e even adult organisations and you're talking about space flight, the question you always guess is how you go to toilet in space. It's always the biggest question. And, and yes, it is. There is the, I mean, everybody says, oh, it looks gleaming and, and shiny. But at the end of the day, the, the environment has to be cope with human bodily functions. So, I mean, urine is, is easiest, obviously, to get rid of to a certain degree. But they do have other bits as well. And, of course, you, you don't want to, how shall we say... Have well, don't say it. Too we many... don't need to say it. We don't. We don't need to say it. We've said enough at that point about bodily functions <laughs> in space. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, let, let's just, in terms of the orbit, and I know we, we've talked endlessly about Branson and Bezos and, and and the competition with Musk. But this is, you know, this is a reminder that SpaceX are just going further and farther than anybody else, and they're just yes. doing stuff that's further down the evolutionary track when it comes to space. Yes, I mean, it's, it's really because Elon Musk has a different vision to the others. I mean, in the case of Branson, it was to take up people who've got lots of money into suborbital flights. Bezos, to do that partially, but also really to, to get involved in the commercial aspects of it. Elon Musk is very different. Elon Musk wants to make sure that the human species is a space-faring species with everything that goes with it. That means orbital flight, explorations of the planets, exploring for taking the mineral resources, in other words, make us a truly space-faring species. And Elon Musk does have that vision for that. And he's unfortunately, though he's a billionaire, he can actually put the money where his mouth is. I mean, a lot of people saying these are billionaires, yes. But I always think there's a lot of people in the world who have lots and lots and lots of money. But what do they do with their money? Do they actually do, and some do absolutely ridiculous things, and they just build huge, bigger and bigger houses and then go to nightclubs all the time. You know, I, I don't want to point to any particular part of society here. But this is a group of people people who actually spend money on things which are really interesting and we're seeing that a lot now i tell you what andrew i don't know if we can just we probably can't but the picture we just had from inside the capsule of the four astronauts mm. uh, all lined up i'm not sure which one uh, jared uh, isaacson is um i think he was the one on the end the taller astronaut and he's the one who's paid but he bought the trip in a sense 200 million dollars i think it was yeah and then the other yeah. seats were allocated on the basis of a raffle and a prize and a competition, and there's a big sort of charity. There he is. There's a there's a big charitable aspect uh, to what they're doing. Yes. At the end of the day, it took one individual's very very deep pockets. But he's hey, he's sitting on the end of a of a giant bomb. So we ought to <laughs> we ought to respect him for his decision. 
Yes, I mean, it, again, I mean, the danger is still is there as it was with anybody, even with Alan Shepard making the, his, the first American space flight in 61. We're still looking at something that was extremely dangerous. And, and I think in some of the some of the coverage that's been done, it's often forgotten, really. This is still exceptionally dangerous. Uh, and they've had to go through six months of training because there is a great risk in it. But life is full of risks. And to be quite honest, would I more interested in spending a risk sitting on top of a rocket than walking down the road where I could get hit by a car? Well, of course, I'm going to sit on top of a rocket rocket it's far more of an interesting opportunity to do it um but yes it is and he has to have deep pockets to do it but it has to start somewhere and these people do i mean i entered the raffle myself unfortunately i didn't get it <sighs> let's talk, talk about near earth news and for the second time since july the international space station has faced an emergency it's emerged that on friday the iss was pushed out of position by a russian spacecraft that had docked with it but which was firing its thrusters too aggressively, those aggressive thrusters. The incident was similar, but probably less serious to the one in July, when the space station was flipped upside down by a visiting Russian module that was trying to pull away from the, the orbiting station. It's about the size of a football field, by the way. Uh, Friday's alert is not believed to have been linked to the presence of a Russian actress, it is all true, <laughs> of a Russian actress and director who were filming a movie. They returned to Earth safely on Sunday using the spaceship that caused the latest incident. I hope you followed all that. Uh, well, with me, the author and space expert, Dr David Whitehouse. Uh, David, thanks for joining us. Um, the, should we go... No, let's, let's start with what's just happened. Uh, serious enough, I mean, an emergency, uh, but, but not as serious as the one in July. Yes, um, the same cause. Uh, the one in July was the Nauka module, which had just been uh, docked with the International Space Station, and that uh, had a software problem and fired its thrusters and really did push the space station well out of position, well out of orientation. Uh, and that seemed to be a software problem, and the only reason that stopped was because the thruster ran out of fuel, ran out of gas. This was a, a similar problem, as you say, from a different spacecraft. This was from the transport spacecraft, the, the Soyuz, uh, which we don't quite know what happened, but it does seem to be another software problem which uh, fired its thrusters when it shouldn't have done, uh, pushed the space station out of position, but not quite as much as a couple of months ago. But it's still very worrying because um, these spacecraft, uh, the Soyuz spacecraft, should be well known, should be well understood. It shouldn't make, pro shouldn't do things like this. Why do we need them when Elon Musk can can, can send his? SpaceX uh, spacecraft to, to dock with the ISS. Why do we need the Russians anymore? I say we. Why do the Americans need them, them anymore? Well, the Russians are um, official partners of the International Space Station. They built a major part of it. Uh, they are in treaty with the United States and with the European Space Agency and, and Japan to, to live and operate on the space station. So they have a right to be there. And for many years after the space shuttle was retired, before Elon Musk came along, they were the only way to get up to and from the space station. So they have a heritage, you know, they have right. a right to be there. Yeah. But uh, right. their, their modules are getting old. The, uh, the, the July incident, I read that the, 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 it didn't just flip over, which sounds incredibly dramatic, uh, but it, was about, it, it sort of flipped over more than once, potentially. But the crew didn't, the crew didn't know. Um, the crew didn't know initially because... This is a zero gravity environment, and when um, when the space station moves, it's you're floating in midair. You don't actually, you know, um, have any reference point to see how it is moving. Uh, you're usually tethered to the space station, to the walls, or to somewhere because you're at a workstation. And it wasn't until the alarms went off that um, that they realized what was happening. The space station has to have a certain orientation with respect to the sun because it needs to get its energy from its solar panels. Uh, and if those solar panels are not being lit by the sun, uh, the space station relies on batteries, as it does so when, um, when it goes through orbital night. So it's important that these batteries get kept topped up. Um, wasn't um, a major problem a couple of months ago, it wasn't a major problem a few days ago. I mean, when the, the um, Mir space station was, was struck in the, the late 1990s, uh, that was a major problem. Um, uh, it, they could have run out of power, they could have had to abandon that space station. So keeping the power, keeping the orientation is, you know, the golden rule of, of operating a space station. Keep it pointing towards the sun. 
And, and we, we know from Friday's incident that the, the, the movie director and actress who were filming on board the International Space Station, um, well, the show went on, didn't it? And we need to see this in the context of the fact that there is, this is happening now. We've got uh, Elon Musk, he's, um, or rather I should say Tom Cruise, is planning on doing something, something in space, filming for a film on, and with Elon Musk, not, not actually with Elon Musk, but on one of his spacecraft. So this is becoming a thing, David. Space is becoming more accessible, um, particularly with Elon Musk and his Dragon capsule. There you see Yulia Perislid. Uh, she's the actress who uh, went up to rescue the uh, cosmonaut on the right there. Uh, they filmed about 30 hours on board the space station, of which they say they're going to use 45 minutes in the film. Uh, but space station is becoming more accessible to a whole bunch of people, not just starship captains like William Shatner, um, oh, but, uh, way, but actresses. And, and the Russians are delighted to have beaten Tom Cruise in making the first film in space. <laughs> they, they expect to make a lot of money from this. It's good uh, publicity. Uh, at a time when actually Putin is not very well favoured towards the Russian space effort, it doesn't get a lot of uh, support from the top. So they're trying everything they can to raise money and to raise its profile. Someone like Ricky Gervais in this country, he says whatever he wants and he doesn't care uh, about the, 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 because he can't be canceled. I still think that even he toes the line a little bit. He's, he thinks about it. I mean, I do think he considers it. You, you have to, you know, because the weird thing is, like for me, like what I, what I feel about what's happening right now. I mean, I feel like I could talk about it on stage because mm. I've, I've, I'm established. But I also think like, you know, if you're partners with, with, uh, the biggest streaming service in the world. And then if you also, you know, you're doing a commercial for this uh, international company. And you do, so you have to think, you know what, how much do I really want to rock the boat? So I, I do think that sometimes I think people forget that this is supposed to be an irritant. You are supposed to, as a comedian, you're supposed to be controversial. You're supposed to take the other side. You're supposed to get the audience to, to question their foundational thinking. That ability to look away and let things be yeah. is a sign of maturity. And behind closed doors, and this is what the racism of law expectations is about, is but those Muslims, they're just not there yet. The, that's really uh, what it boils down that's to. That's a really interesting point as far as that. Is it this expectation that Muslims are, are likely to react violently if they're upset? That's a very patronizing. Yeah, because the Christians isn't it? used to do that in the past. They're over it now. Right. They're old enough. They're mature enough. They're adults. The assumption is, if you're a Muslim, a drawing of the Prophet Muhammad, whether it's flattering or not, is going to offend you. Can you look away? Well, it's not necessarily true. That, that all Muslims would be offended? Well, first of all, it's not true. Yeah. That's, that's, again, why I think it's a form of racism and it's a form of, in itself, if you want to pursue the notion of Islamophobia, yes. it is actually a form of phobia. You're watching GB News Live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage.
I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Welcome back. In a few moments, we'll have a look back at one of our favourite stories of the past few months, Captain Kirk actor William Shatner's trip to orbit. But first, less Star Trek and more Star Wars, or rather Cold Wars, as tensions rise between Russia and the United States. Drama in orbit today after astronauts aboard the International Space Station took to their lifeboats of sorts to avoid debris that may have been created by a Russian anti-satellite weapon. That's quite an opening paragraph. Uh, what's the truth of the matter, however? With me, the author and space expert, Dr David Whitehouse. Uh, David, thanks so much for joining us. Um, this is the ISS going into, quote, near-miss mode every 93 minutes. That's right. It was a result of the um, anti-satellite test carried out by the Russians at three o'clock this morning, a what's called a New Dahl DA ASAT uh, missile was launched from the Plesetsk uh, launch base in Siberia towards Cosmos uh, 1408, which is an old Soviet electronic spy satellite, which was launched 30 years ago. It hasn't been working for 15 or years, so it was a very large two tons target for their new system, which has been tried 10 times before, but never until now has it actually been intended to strike and destroy a satellite. Uh, the American US Department of State has condemned this, and there is a cloud of debris in orbit. Yeah. Was blowing it up in space illegal? No, it's not illegal. Um, there are various... Um, um, treaties against space weapons, and it depends upon what you de design, uh, decide is a space weapon. I mean, China carried out a similar series of tests in 2007. America did one in 2008, and even India uh, a couple of years ago carried out a similar type of test. Um, so if these, these anti-satellite weapons are designed against ballistic missiles, then it is against the OBM treaty. However, against your own satellite, it is a mute point. Um, the United States Department of Defense has said this evening that it shows that Russia is not serious about uh, not having uh, weapons in space because it augurs badly. And it's part of the sign of the times that uh, both China, uh, India, and the United States to a certain, certain degree are looking at disabling their opponent's space assets in, to, in times of conflict. Um, the ISS, we're just going to show some pictures of the International Space Station for those people who uh, need to be uh, reminded of what it looks like. Uh, it can actually, I read, manoeuvre. That's not the ISS, is it? But, uh, but the ISS can... Oh, there's, there's some of the, uh, the... Is it the Soyuz and the, the, um, the new SpaceX thing? Uh, Dragon docking? But it can manoeuvre... That is a module docking, yes. Yeah, it, but the ISS can actually sort of maybe get out of the way is putting it too too grandly, but it can, it can manoeuvre, David. Yes, it does occasionally, uh, quite literally, get out of the way. It can adjust its orbit slightly. It, it has a, an area around it of, uh, of uh, 25 miles, and if any debris that can be trackable, and you can track things the size of, um, oh, I don't know, the size of a chair in space, if any of that is detected to come within that region, then they either try and get the Space station out of the way, or the protocol is to go to the entrances to the return ships and wait. And over and following the explosion of Cosmos 1408 uh, this morning, uh, that debris is going to pass the International Space Station every 93 minutes for the next day or so. And, the, and they've changed the protocol at this moment that for the next day or so, internal hatches will have to stay closed in case there is an impact. Uh, and a depressurization that will then give them more time to, to get out as that damage is isolated. Uh, so it's the first time for the next day on the International Space Station. And the US Space Department is furious that the Russians have carried out this test 
And space operators around the world are, are also furious that thousands of pieces of debris are now threatening useful productive satellites in low Earth orbit. There was a, there was a Hollywood film, wasn't there? Wasn't there um, George Clooney? Gra gravity, gravity. Ooh. That is the echo, yeah. echoes of that. And and this, the seven astronauts actually got in the the lifeboats. They, they got in the two separate craft when this first happened. As you say, they've, they've, they've now changed the protocol and they're they're in the uh, back in the ISS, but closing the hatches internally. But they actually, you know, f get in the lifeboats, guys. It, it could be, be that bad. Yes, they do. The protocol is when there is a serious threat. Um, they have to carry out emergency safing of the space station, and then they go to the entrances of uh, the Dragon capsule and the Soyuz capsule, so that if given the order, they just have to close the door behind them. And it literally then is press the button quickly, and it only takes one button on these craft. It's all automated uh, to, to blow them away from the space station and return them to the Earth. It's that serious. They were prepared to leave the space station untended, um, it, literally at five minutes' notice. Um, it was that serious. I don't think that uh, uh, people in the non-space community have actually, apart from yourself, obviously, have actually got the message that this is an extremely serious event that's causing international tension between particularly America and Russia. I mean, you you are uh, giving us a, a pretty clear sense, David, that this is, you know, in in the scheme of things, this is more than a minor glitch. It's a major incident and something which may have consequences mm. further down the track. And um, there's just a sense, isn't there, that it's, a, it's it's if not quite the Wild West up there, it's getting a bit more contested. It's basically you can do what you can do in the sense if you can do it, who's going to stop you? Um, the, the, the Soviet Union, the Russia, I beg your pardon, has been developing this new Dahl anti-satellite test system. Um, everybody's known about it, but they haven't performed this test in anger yet. The Chinese have got various um, bits of technology in development, and no doubt they could do exactly the same thing. This is part of, I think, principally the relationship between China and the United States in the sense that China wants to become the world's leading spacefaring nation by the 2049 anniversary of the, of the revolution. And they show every sign of being able to do that. Well, it's quite a thing to be 90 and willing to blast off into space. Many of us who aren't nonagenarians would like to think perhaps that when we begin to near 100, we might be more, not less cavalier about embracing some danger. But how many old folk would really do what the actor William Shatner did today? And he's in that capsule, goodness me. It wasn't a long flight aboard the Blue Origin craft, bankrolled by Jeff Bezos's Amazon billions, but it was proof that the man who played James Kirk in Star Trek had indeed the right stuff after all. Here he is, moments after touchdown. What you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. So, uh, I'm so filled with emotion about what just happened. I, I just, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. I hope I never recover from this. I hope that I can uh, maintain what I feel now. I, I don't want to lose it. Joining me, Eric Berger, senior space editor at Ars Technica, based in Houston, and the author of the book Liftoff. It's about the beginnings of Blue Origin's uh, rival SpaceX. Actually, Eric, thanks so much for joining us. We, we're, we're a funny programme here. We tend to do a, a space story most evenings. We think it's one of the, the really defining stories of our age, actually, and this billionaire's face-off between uh, Musk and Bezos is, is absolutely gripping. Uh, how did our understanding of that to that face-off, that rivalry, ad advanced today with this, what on one level was, was a gigantic PR stunt, but also a fabulous story of human endurance for William Shatner. I think it was clearly, as you say, a brilliant marketing ploy on the uh, behalf of Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos to sell, um, to sell his company and their suborbital spaceflight experience. On the other hand, I think it was also pretty arresting to see William Shatner so captured by the experience. He clearly was moved um, by his few minutes of weightlessness. And um, it, it speaks well to the idea that, you know, getting more humans into space would give us a better perspective on our own planet. 
We were talking earlier, Eric, about how we do this story today. Uh, and one of the suggestions that we, was that we look at the, the way it's filmed and edited and processed and put out there. You can see now, I'm not sure you can see our pictures, but we're just looking at a, a gaggle yep. of camera operators filming every moment. And when the landing happened, you know, there was a sound recorder there with a long sound boom. You've got drone upon drone giving you a perspective you just couldn't imagine even a few years ago. There's one long lens trained on the, on, on the new Shepard capsule. Um, and the separation, I mean, this was, you know, in excess of 350,000 feet into space. I mean, there, there is camera kit available now feeding into this public relations exercise, which just gives us an amazing view of what's happening. There's definitely an amazing view, but also we are living in an extraordinary area, era of, of private spaceflight. This year, there are going to be as many as nine all private missions to space. The majority of these will be suborbital flights, just a few minutes, you know, going near or above the Kármán line. But there's also going to be a couple, you know, orbital flights as well. And so, you know, we are entering an era now where the majority of people going to space are not going to be professional astronauts, but are going to be civilians, people who don't do this for a living, actors, celebrities, billionaires, millionaires, and eventually real people as well. Eric, are you a little bit sniffy about the, the suborbital? I mean, I know you, there was no sneer, there's no sneering tone when you use the phrase suborbital, but there is a sense, and you know, I, I, we note that you, you've written about Musk, that he is significantly ahead as things currently stand in this space race. Yeah, Musk and SpaceX are far, far ahead of Blue Origin. Um, and in fact, you know, they have now flown four orbital missions, which, you know, is about 20 times the energy required to get your rocket into orbit and, and get the spacecraft going there. And so it's a much bigger deal to actually get a mission into orbital space. And, and then you have the challenge of actually bringing it back. And when they're in orbit, you have, you know, all of these issues of like, you know, this spacecraft today was, was in space for about a minute, right? And so an orbital flight is hours or days. And so the demands on that vehicle in terms of heating, all sorts of factors is just much, much greater. So, you know, this was a nice achievement, but it really pales in comparison to the idea of sending humans to the moon, to the moons of Mars and to Mars itself. This, this was, is, is almost a sideshow, a very nice sideshow, but it's certainly not the main course. You couldn't put a bit of extra fuel in the tank of this one and, and go deeper into space, could you? That, or that, that's simply beyond its technical limitations? No, it's definitely beyond the technical, it's beyond the capability of the, the performance of this vehicle. Um, you would need to have a rocket about 10 times more powerful to have a chance of getting that capsule in orbit. Wow, wow. Um, um, so given that, what does, what does Bezov have left in his locker? What's, what's the ship he's building, working on to catch up with Musk? Right, so there's this really fascinating race between Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. They both want to build preeminent space transportation companies. And they both see the path to doing that with these large orbital reusable rockets. The big difference is that Musk has actually done it, right? The Falcon 9 has now flown more than 100 times, and they've learned how to land it and reuse it and, and put human missions on top of that. And Bezos has never flown, you know, not let alone people, even a gram of material into orbit. So Blue Origin is behind. They are working on a large orbital rocket. They're working on larger rocket engines and other projects. But you know, they're, they're a good five to 10 years behind SpaceX, and SpaceX has a larger workforce. And so it's, it's every year, actually, the gap between the two companies is getting larger. What do you make of some of the trash talk between these rival organizations and the legal action that Bezos has initiated? Is it, is it really damaging? I mean, could, could we have a situation where they're expending really substantial amounts of energy, uh, capital, money, uh, and time on a, on a legal showdown that actually is that feeds into that narrative that this is two massive alpha males headbutting each other. Yeah. So you're referring to the um, the issue of the the human lander. So NASA and its its international allies, you know, want to go back to the moon, right? And so they needed to go to the commercial industry and ask someone to build them a lunar lander to go down to the surface. And Blue Origin was a bidder for this. SpaceX was a bidder, and SpaceX won. Um, and their bid was far less expensive and they had much more experience, you know, working in, in this kind of environment. Um, Blue Origin is sued and has held up that process for five months. And so, yes, it has hurt Blue Origin's brand. It certainly hurt it within the space community. There's a lot of people who are upset that the, the, the Apollo or the Artemis program to the moon has basically been put on hold for almost half a year. 
Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, totally gripping. And as we've discovered today, uh, really very pictorial and beautiful even to watch. Uh, just one thing before we go, Eric, why the bell? What's happening? Why did they ring the bell as they, as they head on to the gantry? It's a tradition going back to the Mercury program and, it's, and, and, and nautic, nautical tradition. You know, you're sort of ringing the bell like you're, you know, you're going to see. In this case, you're, you're going to space. That was a special edition of Brazier, the new space race. Thanks for watching and have a very Merry Christmas. I'm Neil Oliver. You can join me live every Saturday evening for opinions and discussions about the week's top stories. There's also a smattering of history and archeology span and features that define our great British Isles. You'll hear my thoughts unfiltered, as well as those of my guests, and we don't always agree. And we want to hear from you too. Neil Oliver Live, Saturdays from seven on GB News. Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join me, Mark White, here on GB News. For more than two decades, I've been at the sharp end of reporting crime and security at home and abroad. From the scourge of terrorism to the fight against violent crime and the deepening small boats crisis in the channel, there are issues you rightly care about, and so do I. As GB News home and security editor, my focus will be on the stories that matter to you. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. the weather. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discovery.